Welcome, uh, Carrie Car Blumark, yes, MD, child and adolescent psychiatrist specialist, and uh, related is uh, yeah, well, a lot of disorders I think you are working with, aren't you? Well, so the clinic is working with a lot yeah, of disorders. I'm only okay. working with uh, immune psychiatric okay. okay. And uh, you tell us about uh, what Stockholm is doing and the specialized patents team that you have here. Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me here. It's a bit scary like this to, to talk to so many of our patient parents that I recognize as a first and colleagues as well. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about our experiences from the Stockholm Pants team. We've been working for five years now and uh, we are slowly developing into an immune psychiatric research unit. So we start out with talking a bit about the clinic and then we will go on to uh, the research uh, that is ongoing. So, when we started in 2014, uh, our overall objective with the clinic was to increase the knowledge about the combination of psychiatric, neurological, rheumatological and immunological symptoms that currently are characterized as PANS. And we also uh, wanted to develop the care pathways for the assessment of uh, these patients because, uh, as we had heard, many of you uh, have been seeing a lot of doctors and you've been traveling around Sweden. Many of you went from Sweden uh, and abroad to get care. So this was also part of, of uh, our goals. Uh, the clinic is at Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Research Center in Stockholm. We're a specialized OCD and related disorders clinic. Uh, we currently have around 800 OCD and related disorders patients, and out of those, currently 80 fulfill PANS criteria. Uh, it's a collaboration, it's a research unit, so it's a collaboration between Stockholm County Council, or Region Stockholm, and uh, Karolinska Institute. When we started in 2014, there was one part-time doctor and one part-time psychologist. We met patients for one hour and then we tried to decide, okay, is this pants or is this not pants? We had no idea. And, and the more patients we saw, we realized, okay, this is super complicated, we know nothing. So we have uh, developed uh, an assessment procedure that is uh, quite a long one. I will take you through it step by step. It's a team approach. Uh, before the patient comes to us, uh, we have questionnaires that the family responds to online. So we have an online uh, data collection platform. Uh, so we have some, some info when we see the parents for the first time. For the first visit, uh, it's a doctor uh, just seeing the parents. So we have one and a half hours. We sit down, we go through the entire patient history. We go through everything from birth up to the current age of the kid. We go through uh, uh, the family history. Uh, we uh, give information on the research studies that we're doing and also the consent forms and everything. Uh, the second visit is a face-to-face -face visit with the patient. Then it's a doctor and a psychologist. So we do the full somatic assessment, we order lab tests, and uh, the psychologist is doing the rating scales, sometimes a cognitive assessment, and uh, taking the psychological history. After that, we have a lot of information on the kid. So then we sit down, the entire team, we have a clinical conference. Uh, we also discuss the lab results, we discuss the psychological part, the psychiatric part, the somatic part, and we try to reach a consensus. And in most cases, we think we can reach a consensus. So then we, we plan the, the treatment plan or the referral to another unit if we think that the kid is better helped elsewhere. Uh, then we ask the patient back for a third time. And we talk through the whole assessment procedure and we, we give the treatment plan. In some cases, the kid is uh, severely ill when they come to us and might need uh, further somatic assessments like an MRI, like uh, EEG, a lumbar puncture, uh, or you might need to start with a new neuromodulatory treatment rather soon. Uh, then we have neuroinflammation rounds. It's a meeting that we have twice monthly uh, with the rheumatology and neurology 
and as a child psychiatry, and there we take a, a kind of team consensus regarding further somatic assessments and uh, immune treatments for the kids. <coughs> so, for the psychiatric assessment, we take a psychiatric history. Uh, we focus on, on pre-existing symptoms uh, as well as stressors. We actually used the PNISI that you heard uh, Susan Benirut uh, talk about yesterday. Uh, we used, the, we used uh, the clinical interview. We're trying to, to learn how to uh, do it effectively. We, we think it's very useful. Um, we take a school history. Very often our psychologists are in contact with the school to, to get uh, uh, like a full uh, school history from the teacher or mentor of the kid. We do a psychiatric differential diagnosis uh, via a semi-structured interview called Minikid that is uh, frequently used in Sweden. Uh, we do rating scales, uh, cybox for OCD, YGTSS for tics, and then uh, symptoms uh, specific ones for separation anxiety, oppositional behaviors, uh, sleeping disorders for example. Some kids have a cognitive assessment when we find that's needed, and we ask for films. We love films. We ask for films and we put them in the patient records. We want films from the onset, from flares, from movement disorders, from tics. Was someone, was a parent calls a tic? Maybe I think it's something else. Maybe I think it's a choreotic movement. What my, my colleague, uh, the psychiatrist at the outpatient unit, says it is a uh, choreotic movement. Maybe it's epilepsy. Maybe it's, uh, it's something totally different. So films are great. Uh, we try to get handwriting samples, we try to uh, get drawings, whatever we can get. Uh, in our clinic, actually, the psychiatrist is doing the full somatic assessment. It's super fun because you get to be a doctor even though you're a psychiatrist. <laughs> so, we, we do this. We've been teach uh, by our rheumatologist and also by Jennifer Frankovic uh, when we started. How to uh, what to look for? Uh, so we go through. We we look for uh, pain, fatigue, weight loss. Uh, we do a heart lens, uh, thyroid examination. Uh, we look a lot on the skin, and we take pictures. If there's something we don't understand, we take pictures, and we show someone that knows what it is. Uh, we do a new nose and throat exam. Uh, we look for these uh, palatal patechiae that you heard of yesterday. So I don't, but it's the dots that they're in the palate that can be a sign of ostrep or also EV or other kinds of uh, infectious uh, disorders. Uh, we look for signs of sinusitis. Uh, we look for uh, uh, otitis, external otitis, otitis media. We do full uh, neurology uh, examination and we also look at the motor function. And we try to do a, a joint examination to look for swelling or pain as good as we can. It's very complicated with rheumatology, but we try. Here is uh, an example of what we can get when we ask for uh, handwriting or drawings. Uh, this is uh, an 11 year old boy. Uh, before he fell sick, he wrote perfectly normal, like 11 year old boys do. So maybe not perfect, but very nice and very easy to read. The first picture is uh, from uh, when he was really sick. And he took, it took a long time for him to try to do this. He couldn't get the letters out of his hand. So he explained that he had them in his head, but he couldn't get his hand to do the movements. Uh, the picture to the right is, is quite interesting, I think, because this is after working with an occupational uh, therapist, uh, working quite a lot. He had also had uh, anti-inflammatory treatments. This is the last symptom that he had. Everything else from his pants was gone. But once he started writing, he started writing with the letters twisted. Like, how do you say that in English? I'm not sure. They are uh, twisted around. And he wrote rather quickly, and everything was turned the wrong way around. Now this symptom is also gone, but it's very, sometimes very strange and very interesting what the brain can do. So the lab tests, 
that we do. This is our uh, protocol that we do for all the patients. Uh, we look at a few uh, immune markers uh, and we also look for, uh, for infection. We do a throat swab, then we do on all patients and then we take the adequate serologies uh, depending on the medical history. So for the treatment, this is the complicated part. Uh, we try to do the best we can do with very little evidence and rather little guidance. We try to treat as effectively as possible without harming the kid. And uh, for us this means that we treat verified infections. And with verified infections, we, think we, try, we treat when there is a high uh, suspicion of infection. We don't have to have a positive throat swab or a, a positive chest x-ray or anything, but if we have a, a high suspicion that okay, there is some infection, then we treat it. Uh, if the kid has a typical onset or course, we start out with NSAIDs. That's anti-inflammatory, it's like naproxen. And we use rather high doses. We use rheumatology doses, not the normal kind of lose your fever and have a, have a cold kind of dose. We use rheumatology doses. We always combine this with esomeprazole, which is uh, like Nexium, something you have to protect uh, your stomach from ulcers. Um, Sometimes we see what we find is almost miraculous uh, effects of NSAIDs. When we started with, with, with this, we thought, of course, naproxen can't take this away. And, and it doesn't, it doesn't take it away, but for some kids, it's really the, the difference between not being at school at all to in a few weeks being fully back to school. And that's a good uh, measurement point. Uh, if the child is very sick or has clear neurological symptoms, we go directly to our kind of third line treatment, which is cortisone or IVIG, depending on the disease course of the kid, depending on the lab tests, depending on what we think that the kid can tolerate. We, in our experience, many kids respond to, uh, to cortisone, uh, but some of them can't tolerate it because of side effects. So these kids might feel better uh, on IVIG. But if we can keep a kid with oral cortisone pulses, which means you take cortisone pills for three days per month, for a few months, then it's a lot better for the, for, for the kid. It's easier to cope with that kind of medication than having to go once monthly to the hospital to get a needle on IVIG. But, as I said, some of, some of the kids don't tolerate it. Uh, when we started out with cortisone, we first treated with, with daily doses of prednisone, which was a lot easier to, to handle for the kids, but, but also gave side effects like growth inhibition and uh, this redistribution of body fat, so that the kids got uh, Cushing syndrome, which is not fine. We also treat the symptoms. We treat the psychiatric symptoms. We treat sometimes uh, OCD with SSRIs. We treat uh, uh, sometimes severe tics with guanfacine, with good effect, your doses of guanfacine. We very rarely, but sometimes, treat with antipsychotics. We give uh, melatonin for sleep sometimes. Um, we give uh, CBT for almost every kid. Every kid has a psychiatrist. And maybe in a flare you cannot you cannot be active in a CBT treatment, but the parents can. So then we can give CBT parent strategies, how to handle their child's outbursts or uh, oppositional behaviors. Uh, we have two fantastic nurses who uh, have developed this kind of parental strategy uh, course for parents. And they use something that is Swedish called Kumiat, it's, uh, it's usually a, a parent uh, strategy course developed for ADHD. Uh, they have adapted it for pan's families, and it means you see, uh, you see this little group of uh, families for, for 12 times during a semester. So we have this every spring and autumn semester, and it's, I think, one of our most appreciated, uh, one of the most appreciated things we do. Uh, we keep a close follow-up because the symptoms change over time. 
we don't really know, we, we don't yet know which, uh, which kid will be uh, on a more uh, degenerative or progressive course, which ones that will have a more uh, um, relapsing remitting course and might get back to, uh, to uh, normal behavior, normal school functioning between the flares. So these, our treatment uh, routines uh, is possible to, to reach online. They're, they are reachable online as this document. They are clinical routines, they are not guidelines. They are clinical routines, but they, they have a clear uh, algorithm of how we treat a why. So we have gone through uh, uh, the available literature and we also look closely to the Pan's Research Consortium guidelines when we, we develop this, but they are clinical routines. So, then we come to uh, the research part of it. Uh, to begin with, uh, we have uh, made two, uh, or our team has made two uh, EPI studies on uh, autoimmune disorder and OCD and tics, because we, we often feel that okay, these disorders go together. So the first one is from 2016, uh, it's a systematic review, it's of uh, 74 studies, showing that there is some evidence for an association between OCD and tics and autoimmune disorder. Uh, but of course, uh, in this material, it's also rheumatic fever, for example, where OCD is one of the primary uh, symptoms. Uh, the second one uh, is uh, from 2018, where it's an EPI study showing that uh, individuals with OCD and tic disorder have a higher comorbidity with autoimmune disease than a normal population. So we know that somehow these disorders are linked. And uh, we try to collect data. Uh, it's difficult to, to uh, push clinical data into nice research because the patients, they do a bit like they want. We, uh, uh, one gets better, one gets worse. Then the school, if there's problem in school, and, uh, or, you know, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not a clean, randomized trial. Uh, but we published the, first, uh, for the data from the first 45 patients. Uh, from our cohort. The cohort has now grown, so now we have closer to 70 patients, but the data is not processed yet. Um, this data is from 2014 to 2018. During this time we had 100 referrals. We found that half of them fulfilled criteria for PANS, or 47. That's strict research criteria for PANS. Uh, almost everyone, 45 consented to inclusion in the cohort. You see that our cohort is, is quite young. Mean age of symptom onset is 7.5 years. It took them one and a half years to come to us. And, and one interesting part here, if you see that uh, they're quite young, but only um, Eight out of 45, 18% had a pre existing psychiatric or neuropsychiatric diagnosis. But as many as 11 out of 45, 24%, had a pre existing autoimmune disease or inflammatory disorder, a clear diagnosis. That's very high. That's a lot higher in the normal population for that age group. It's also interesting that another 7, another 16%, had a concurrent onset of autoimmune disease or inflammatory disorder in temporal uh, relation to symptom onset. So the PAN symptom came with the diabetes onset or with the thyroid disorder or with the celiac onset and was diagnosed in our clinic. Okay, this is difficult to see, but the symptoms at presentation and when they came to our clinic, uh, almost all of them have OCD. 83% have OCD. That's not strange because we are an OCD and related, related disorders clinic, so there's a bias. So we have OCD. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, when asked, as many as uh, a third of the patients had also pain, debilitating pain. But no one said this when they arrived. It's just from questioning that you can find out that the kid has pain, that they don't go skateboarding or they don't go jumping on the trampoline anymore. Or... So quite a high uh, prevalence of somatic symptoms as well. 
We look closely at the family history, uh, and here we can see more or less the same as we see uh, in the kids themselves, that 64% uh, of the kids, they have a family history of psychiatric disorder. That's quite normal, because if we look in our own families, we would have a, an aunt or a grandma or someone who had a depression or anxiety or something, it's very common. Uh, but 76% they had a family history of autoimmune disease. That's not a story. So these kids are special that way. These are the lab tests at onset. And here we can see that uh, we have uh, quite a high prevalence of positive ANA. This is at onset. When we wait uh, and, and take repeated blood tests during flares, uh, we get even higher numbers. So during flares, uh, we see that up to 20 or 25% of the kids have a positive ANA. We also see that 37% that had uh, complement activation, which means low C3 and low C4. Find very interesting. We didn't find anything in the cytokines, but we we take the wrong ones. We learn now because uh, we have to, we have to uh, adapt after what we learned at this conference. Of course, these blood tests are, are just taken on. Um, they're taken on pants kids. We know more or less the prevalence of, uh, of positive uh, markers in the normal population. But we don't know if these ones can help us to diagnose PANS. Uh, a good biomarker needs to be able to discriminate between the normal OCD case and the PANS case to early help us decide which kid would benefit from the therapy, for example. What we can see that is that there's a strong association with autoimmune disease. how many of them also will develop other autoimmune diseases later in life. So, uh, our ongoing studies, uh, we're continuing uh, the inclusion in the PANS cohort. Uh, we're also inviting our patients back for a follow-up. So, right now we are inviting the ones back that we assessed in 2014 and 2015. Because there aren't much follow-up data on PANS kids. We don't know how they feel five years later or four years later. So, uh, we invite them back, we retake the full biomarker protocol, we, uh, we uh, do a, a new assessment, the psychiatric and somatic ones, and we also uh, evaluate uh, the suitability of the measures that we use. It's difficult to find a good measure for PANS because there are so many different symptoms. And we also describe the treatments they received and how they perceived them. Uh, so the perceived helpfulness. This is not a treatment uh, study, but it's, we describe how the parents perceive it. Uh, we are also working on uh, uh, an OCD-related uh, disorders control group so that we can see if these biomarkers are different in the OCD patient and the PANS patient. So we started to include uh, OCD patients without any suspicion of, uh, of PANS. And we will check for, for the biomarkers, but we will also check for family history and comorbidity with uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, so far it's not promising because their biomarkers are also a bit off. Uh, we collect DNA. Uh, we're part of an international OCD genetics product, so we, uh, we collect DNA for the subgroup of PANS patients. And uh, uh, finally, I've also promised uh, the professor in our clinic, David Matej Kols, to uh, advertise his uh, study. He's very interested in CBT and he wants to know uh, other experts treating PANS, how they work with CBT. So please email him or, uh, or take a copy of this link and just uh, respond to his survey. It takes five minutes, it's super quick, just to get a, an idea of how CBT is used for this patient group. So, to finish off, uh, we were lucky enough to receive funding to, uh, to create uh, a unit, a research unit uh, with a broader immunopsychiatric scope, starting this year, 2019. Uh, 
because when we have met PANS patients the last few years, we also see a lot of patients that we feel will be helped by new treatments, that we feel will be helped by, by uh, NSAIDs, for example. And we see that they have the same kind of onset, they have the same kind of disease course, but maybe the symptoms differ. Maybe they have more autistic symptoms or more behavioral symptoms, but not OCD or tics. Uh, so this is a, a multi-specialist unit, uh, or a team, of uh, uh, psychiatrists, rheumatology and neurology specialists, you're in, uh, under one roof. Uh, we have uh, a more standardized assessment and care, uh, more efficient data collection, and uh, the plan is to, to reach the future treatment trial, but we're not there yet. So now we're three doctors and two psychologists and one nurse. It's much more fun than being half a doctor and half a nurse, or half a psychologist. Uh, we also have a research collaboration with immunology that helps. So, to refer a patient to us, uh, it no longer has to be a, a clear PANS case. Uh, it's supposed, it can be an immuno, suspected immunopsychiatric case. And these are the criteria that we, uh, that we use our operational definition of immunopsychiatry. So, Onset or worsening of multiple severe psychiatric symptoms in combination with somatic symptoms, loss of established functions, and abrupt and neurotypical disease onset or course. And it can then be in temporal relation to uh, inflammation or infection or other autoimmune disorder. We, st we need referrals, so we can't uh, take, uh, you, you cannot come to us as a parent alone, but we need. We need a referral from uh, from child psychiatry or from the uh, pediatric unit. So tell your doctors to talk to us. My take-home message for all the psychiatrists: We should not forget that we are doctors. There is a body attached to the brain. So uh, think broader about the etiology. There are other possible treatment options that sometimes give very nice results, other than the psychopharmacological ones. Collaborate with colleagues. Call the, the somatic doctor, call the immunologist, ask. And uh, sometimes a zebra actually is a zebra, in other words. Here's the team. And this is my favorite slide. Uh, this is a young, young man with pants. This is his comment on how it was to get the first cortisone treatment. So this is two weeks after the first cortisone treatment, after he was sick for several years. And this is how he explained it. It feels like I have policemen in the immune who hit the pandas with those sticks that policemen have in their belts so that it becomes flat as a pancake and can't hurt anyone. I think it's excellent. Well, how should I 
put it. Are you, are you trying to avoid IVIG if you can take something that is not so expensive? Uh, so far we haven't had to avoid IVIG because of the cost. Maybe we are getting there because this gets, this, it becomes a more frequent treatment. Um, but so far we, we have not ended up there. Uh, we have more patients on IVIG now than a few years ago, uh, which is of course an increased cost for the neurology clinic. It's uh, also difficult to administer because it's, they literally do not have space to give all the IVIGs in their specialist daycare. Uh, so that is a problem. Uh, but it's also that we start to understand more about which patient we think will benefit more from IVIG than from cortisol or the other way around. So we are quicker on the IVIG now than a few years ago okay. because we can see that there is a group uh, with hypoglobulinemia, for example, and uh, some other autoimmune comorbidity that, uh, that seem to feel better, uh, have better results from the IVIG. And uh, I know we, we, ha we don't have the time, but I really wonder, uh, can you foresee which patient is going to relapse? I mean, these relapses are really... We sad. hope that this follow-up will help us yeah. to see how do they feel now and what could we have understood earlier in the process. So, so we have to wait. And how long time is this going to take? <laughs> well, we're starting, so... Uh, a couple year? of years? A year? A year? Okay, yes. Something like that. We're starting seeing questions now. So yeah. Yeah. Looking forward for, to your results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.